Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to this new very important session and very much asked about by Muslims and non-Muslims alike it's about the issue of determinism or godly determinism of human free will in fact this constitutes one of the pillars of Islamic faith uh, with the, obviously you know that there are five pillars of Islam but there are six pillars of Iman and تُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهُ مَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُولِهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ بِالْقَدْرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَرِّهِ that, that, you, that you believe in Allah and the, messen, uh, the, Allah and the angels in the books and his messengers and the last day and the qadr which is the pre divine predestination khayrihi wa sharri the good of it and the bad of it and today we're going to be answering or a lot of our efforts will be directed to one question central question which is the question that i put in the first slide which is where is there space for human free will with an omnipotent god who knows and wills the future so we as Muslims believe in two different, actually four levels of qadr. It's not just one level. We believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knows the future, number one. We believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has willed the future. We believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written the future, number three. And number four, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has created. It does khalq of the things of the future as well. Created it, creation. So there are four distinct layers of qadr. Uh, so just to repeat, who who, who wants to re who, j to repeat what I just re said? Um, say there's four layers of yeah. qadr. So one that Allah He knows the future, two that Allah has willed the future, three that Allah has written the future, and four that Allah He creates the future. Okay, has and wh what has He created? What has He sorry? Uh, where has He written the future? Um, in the preserved tablet. In the preserved Allah Okay, and wh where is that? Wh what's that? Um, uh, that was like one of the first creations. So Allah, He created the pen, um, and I think three other things. So the pen, the arsh, um, the preserved tablet, and was it the was it the sea? I mean, the uh, I mean, there's difference of opinion. I think you're going to a difference of opinion as to what was the first thing that was created. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's certainly one of the first yeah, things that was created. With the pen, the based yeah. the history of everything was written. Yeah, everything I mean, that well, was to happen. If you think about it f technologically, for the sake of argument, right? Mm. The preserved tablet is a bit like a SIM card. Okay, I know this is tashbih, uh, but it's qiyas al awla, yeah. and this is allowed. Even Imam Ahmed mentions this in his kutub and stuff. Which is basically, and this is for Allah, so this is uh, awla, it's makhluq, it can be done. Yeah. Which is, if you, if you think of a card that you have, you know, a bank card or something, you know, you put it in a machine and it tells you all the thing. This preserved tablet is like the technological equivalent of some kind of SIM card that like, has all the information, the DNA of the future, if you like, has the DNA of the world, the universe, everything inside of it. Allah has uh, has put that; He's put that in place for us. Everything that's ever be that ever was, is, or will be is in that tablet. Uh, what does that tablet look like? Is it is it physical? Like you know, can you imagine it? You're probably thinking of some kind of a stone here, but really we don't know what this thing looks like. Um, this is something which goes beyond the scope of human imagination but it's referred to as Allah al-Mahfuz and um, Allah created it and it acts like some kind of a um, nucleus or, or of all the things like DNA or something, you know, SIM card type situation so Allah has done all those things and obviously the question is how can that be the case and human being at the same time has this free will has this free will now this is a question which is troubled uh, human beings for, for, for millennia, actually, not for, for, not for centuries, but for millennia. As long as human beings have lived on planet Earth, this is a problem that has troubled human beings. And what you'll find interesting is that it's a problem that troubled human beings, not just within, obviously, the Islamic paradigm. It's, it's troubled human beings within almost every paradigm or every um, intellectual tradition that has ever existed that aims to explain human behavior and or has a meta-narrative about the human condition. And we'll, we'll start with, and this is interesting, what kind of um, philosophers of today, how they break it down. So we're talking about secular philosophers of the West. And in secular philosophy, there are three schools of thought. There are three schools of thought, distinct schools of thought. And um, the first one is libertarianism. Okay, so this idea, and we're not talking about liberal theory or political liberalism, we're talking about this idea that human beings have free will 
unencumbered free will, which, uh, and there is no determinism. Okay? Determinism is the idea that, look, this is how they put it. There is an uninterrupted causal chain of events which, f which forces human beings to do the things that they are doing. It's like a domino situation. If you push a domino, you'll see dominoes hit each other. And if you were to reverse the sequence, you'll see why each domino was knocked down by the previous domino. Such that really, everything that I am saying now, and in fact all the thoughts that I have in my mind, and in fact everything that I'm doing as well, is being controlled by a set of pre prior events which forced me to do what I'm doing. So I might drink this, uh, this Capri Sun, okay, and then after 20 minutes I might feel the urge to go to the toilet. This uh, Capri Sun therefore caused me to go to the toilet, in a sense. And it was, and it's like that with everything. And if we know the pre prior conditions, then we will know the future. But because not everyone knows the mechanics of the universe and the prior conditions, not anyone can just tell the future. The determinist position is very compelling. And in fact, one of the most powerful philosophical positions that is adopted in secular philosophy in the modern age. Why? Because if you believe in cause and effect, if you believe one thing causes another thing, and A causes B, okay, and if you believe that things happen because of their causes, then that's basically the conclusion. Therefore, anything that is happening now is eventually happening because of a uh, set of events of the, of the past. We are controlled by our pasts. We are, our we are uh, the puppets. This is a cosmic ventriloquism. What you're seeing now is a puppet being moved. I'm a puppet. I am being moved around, okay? There's no strings, but I am being moved around by... The strings are my pa the past. The past is moving me around. What past? The past conditions, the causes of the past. They are moving me around. You can see no strings. But I am moving, I am thinking, I am speaking, I am talking. Now, all of, all of my actions and cognitions and thoughts and process, all of that is because of something that's happened in the past that's causing me to do it. Meaning, really, the hard determinist position says we have no free will. If free will is unencumbered ability to choose A over B, libertarian free will, there is no free will. Because everything that I am doing, I am being forced to do it, compelled to do it, by that which has come before me. And this is a very strong and powerful position. Because if we believe in cause and effect, then that's it's a very strong and powerful. However, there is a third school of thought, which is, the, I would say, the school of thought of the majority. The vast majority of Muslim, non-Muslim uh, people, which is it's called the compatibilist position. Now, the thing is, this is where it gets a bit murky. Because we, I have a first-person subjective experience that I'm in control of my own actions. I feel, I feel as if I am in control of me picking up this Capri Sun right now. It's me that's doing it. It's not, it's not a cause of antecedent events or uh, uninterrupted causal chain that's doing this. It's me that's doing it. I feel that. Now, you might think that's very subjective. But they would say exactly that is very subjective, but so is cogito ergo sum. So is the idea that I think therefore I am, which is the foundation of rationalism in the West. It starts as a first person experience. You remember when we talked about the thing, the bedrock of Western rationalism is Descartes when he said, when he went into the systematic doubt and at the end of it he said, I think therefore I am. And he said, this is the most powerful thing. And we said actually, more powerful than it would be to say that exist, there is existence, there's no doubt. That, but the idea is, you only know these things subjectively, you see. It, it, it is subjective that I am in control of my own words, emotion, And we, we, we operate on that basis, in fact. The justice system is predicated on that basis. That we are in control of our, uh, of our actions and that other people are in control of their actions. Which is why, by the way, you'll find that liberal philosophers like Thomas Hobbes, he was a compatibilist. J.S. Mill was a compatibilist. Because they saw the, they, they saw the problem in... Uh, first of all, because they rationed, rationalized it in the ways that we've just spoken about. But, but secondly, because they saw the problem in blaming people when they're not in charge of any of their actions. If you have a philosophy which is a moral philosophy, or any of the ethical philosophies we went through, or, or indeed any religion that says that you have to do things and don't do things, it's hard to have that position and say, well, actually, you're not in control of any of your actions. How, what are you responsible for then? 
you see. So these are the three main positions. And obviously, as you know, the Sunni position is uh, a compatibilist position. So it says there is an existence of all those four things that we've spoken about, which is God's knowledge of the future, God's writing of the future, God's willing of the future, God's uh, creating the future, but that at the same time, there is human free will. How those two things come together, we're going to speak about in the course of this discussion, but the, you will not be fully satisfied. And I have to <laughs> get, tell you uh, this straight away. Just like most compatibilists are not fully satisfied, just like people in the secular philosophical tradition are not going to be fully satisfied, when, when if satisfaction for you is knowing the mechanics of this, because knowing the mechanics of this is unknowable. How these two things exist at the same time, it's unknowable. And people have tried and, and grappled, and, but I tell you now after looking at all of the traditions that nothing is satisfactory in terms of understanding the mechanics of it. But there are some things which we can explain, which we will explain, right? So, <coughs> In fact, uh, I think the closest, um, in terms of the secular tradition, there's a man called Harry Frankfurt, who I think in 1969, or potentially 1971, he had something called Frankfurt Cases. And he, was, he revived compatibilism. And I don't want to go deeply into what Frankfurt Cases are, but they are basically situations where you seemingly are making a decision of, of your own, but that decision was predetermined all along. And he, he has this uh, example of, I think his name is Black and Jones. So Jones is one person, Black is, uh, and, and, and one of them says to the other one, that if you don't kill this person, that you are, that X, Y, Z. And um, so, if you don't kill this person, I'm going to kill him, for example. So the, the, the killing of said person was always going to happen. But that Jones has a choice whether to kill him or not, and he kills him. Think, things like that, which, which show, if you really think about it, the possibility of there being something which is previous always going to happen, i.e. the killing of person X. But at the same time, uh, but at the, same time the person has some kind of a choice. But when this, when this reaches the realm of theology, there are some serious uh, difficulties with these kinds of cases. I'll give you another example. For example, if I were to say, someone's going to jump into a swimming pool. Yeah? Someone jumping into a swimming pool. But w as they're jumping into the swimming pool, they're jumping with a certain force and velocity. Yeah? But they are being pushed at the same force and velocity that is required for them to go into the swimming pool with exactly the same motion. Now, if they don't do anything, they'll go in the swimming pool anyway because they're being pushed. But they are deciding to jump at the same time as they are being pushed. Do you see this? And it seems like a very good example. So actually, this shows you how you can have free will and determinism at the same time. But what are the problems with this example? In making that decision must have also been determined. Yeah, so the pushing, or yeah, him, him jumping, him, him jumping itself. Yeah, yeah. If, 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 determinism, if determinism is true, yeah. then him jumping in the swimming pool itself, right, him jumping, not being pushed, but him jumping is also not under his own control. Mm -hmm. Do you see the point? So it sounds like a fantastic uh, way out, compatibil con compatibilistic way out. But when you, when you analyze it and you think about it, you realize actually there's a flaw in this. Do you see the point? And we'll come to Ibn Qayyim, he tries to do something similar. He wrote a book called Shifat al-Alil, and he gives an example quite similar to this. But we'll see together what the flaw is. And who are we to say, no, why not? Because Ibn Qayyim is a human being, just like anyone else, right? But you'll see what the flaw is. And what his, he gives an example, you know, and which there is a flaw, there is a naqs in it, there is a deficiency in it. But obviously he does it with qarib al-ma'na, which is to bring it, to bring the situation closer to your dhihn, to, uh, to your understanding. And his, his contribution, his book is very, very, very important. It's called Shifa'ul Ali. I don't think it's been translated. Parts of it have been, though. Yeah. Uh, parts of it have been, but not all of it has been. And in Christianity, they have the same conundrum. So they have uh, Calvinism. Now, Calvinism 
and we'll come to Islam because we haven't we haven't really covered what the Islamic schools of thought are. But Calvinism, uh, so called because of John Calvin, okay, it stresses God's sovereignty over human action to the point where the the um, detractors of Calvinism, let's just say for the sake of argument, they say that this is a deterministic position. They say this is what well, well, they say that God is in control of everything. And um, R.P. Sproul, who was one of the Calvinists of like the last hundred years, once since one of the top Calvinists, he d he now redefines what f they have to redefine what free will is. Well, it's not really redefining it; it's defining it in a certain way. Um, but th once again, Calvinism, as we'll see, is close to Ashariism. It's very close to Ashariism in the Islamic paradigm. These these two things. So the, the 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 focus is and the stress is on godly sovereignty over human free will, whereas Arminianism, so called because of Arminius, I'm not sure if you've heard of this uh, person, who basically we have Protestantism, okay, and then you had these different you had these different proponents of Protestantism in the mid like say 16th century etc. John Cal obviously Martin Luther as you know, but John Calvin and this uh, Arminius, yeah. And they opposed one another when it came to this matter of free will. And that's why the schools of thought are distinct from one another, because they have different ideas when it comes to free will and godly determinism. So Calvinism, it, f it focused more on God's sovereignty. And it saw that anything that emphasized human free will, agency, over and above godly sovereignty, would be um, depreciating from the sovereignty of God. Because if God is in, is in control of everything, they say, if God is in control of everything, then how can you how can you be in control of anything? If you want to put it that way, right? If God is in control of everything, then how can you be in control of anything? If God is all powerful, so they see this as uh, as a problem. But the Armenians as actually say they go they go as far as to say that God is not in control of everything. And they, and this is you'll see uh, the Martesilis kind of maybe leaning in their direction. So the Martesilis and Armenians are quite similar. The Calvinists and the Asharis are quite similar. Now, Molinism, I'm not sure if Molina, if you've heard of this person, and now William Lane Craig is advocating this uh, position, which is called middle knowledge. But it leans, I would say, more to the Armenian position, which is, the, you know, you'll find some of the proponents of Molinism actually saying that, well, God doesn't know the full future, or there's some things which God doesn't know, which is more like Martesilism. So you'll see that it's in every school of thought, whether it's atheistic, secular, Christian, Muslim, we can say the same thing about Judaism, but you'll find that th they're struggling with this. And when they go in one direction, they compromise one thing. And when they go in the other direction, they compromise another thing. And it's very difficult not to go in either of the two directions and not make any compromises. Unless one is making, willing to make certain concessions, which we are going to make today. Which is uh, concessions of ignorance. Uh, and this is this basically it. Um, in Islam, you had groups. As you know, now it's, they refer to them as Qadariyah and Jabariyah. Okay, but these people didn't exist. Like, no one called themselves Am Qadari. No one called themselves like that. Once again, I, you know, um, th this, these are terms that are used pejoratively against these groups. But these groups themselves, they call themselves different things. So the Qadariyah are really the Mu'tazila. They're probably the best proponents of them. And the Mu'tazila. It's difficult to know what they actually believed in. Because we do have some of their books, definitely. Like Al-Qadi Abdul Jabbar, who is like some kind of a genius, this guy. Yeah, You know, he's written books. He doesn't actually, when I've looked at, I've tried my best to do these people, because they're extinct now, almost. You know, they, they don't exist, these Martezilis. Like, they don't, demographically, they don't, there's, there's no Martezili mosque in London, for, put it that way. And there may be not one uh, in the whole of Europe, one Martezili mosque. Martesilis really are confined to the, acad uh, to the academy, like liberal Muslims who consider themselves like Martesili inclined or whatever. That's, w that's where they are, you know. Uh, you don't find like Martesilis. And that's a lot of it is political reasons, to be honest with you. It's because, you know, the Ash'aris and the Hanbalis had more political power than the Martesilis and they were driven out and all this kind of things. A lot of it is maybe because of the weakness of their arguments. But it's not as, I would say... Um, although it's difficult to make this case, as the main reason. Because I would say the main reason is politics. Why this group became uh, extinct. But basically, they, uh, 
They don't believe Allah, definitely. We said that Qadr is four things. They don't be believe Allah created the future. That's definite, 100%. Like He created our actions. Now the Quran says, He created you and your actions. Okay? But they, they have a ta'wil for that. They have a particular interpretation of that. They don't a agree with that. So they don't believe Allah has created our actions like that. They also don't believe... I mean, some of, this is, I think, a misconception. So this is... If you read the books of Salafis and Ash'aris, they will say that they don't believe that Allah knows the future. But when I looked into their own books, to be completely fair, I didn't see that. Like Al-Khadi Abdul Jabbar, is, I don't think he said that. That Allah does not know the future. Or at least they didn't put it that clearly. And this is just to be completely honest. Even though our guys say that, they, they said that, some of them said that, it doesn't mean that just because our guys said that, <laughs> that that's actually what they said. I would like to see the evidence of where they say, well, like someone like Al Khadi Abdul Jabbar said that. I know there were some Mu'tazilis that did say that, that Allah does not know the future, which is similar to the Molinist position. But the heads of them, like uh, Al Qadi Abdul Jabbar, um, didn't say that. From what I know, and I, I'm not saying I've read everything he's written, but it's a shallow pool. Like you can read two or three books, and you can see where he, what, what he's kind of saying about the situation. Yeah. yeah. Why did they go to that? Why, why did they say that Allah doesn't know the future? Because it was they, it's, it's the issue of qadr, right? So it's the issue of if he knows the future, then he's written it for he knows the future. Then they saw that as uh, imp uh, impeding on human free will. What about the preserved tablet? How do they explain that then? Yeah, that's, a, that's a good one. They'll, they'll make their own ta'wil. Remember, the ones who say that Allah does not know the future are not the prominent Mu'tazilis. They are the, the minority ones which their books are not really out there. Do you know what I mean? If Allah knows what you're going to do, doesn't mean that you can't then choose what you're going to do. Yeah, that's true. The, the main tension, by the way, is not to do with knowledge. The main tension is to do with creation. I think that's it. You can say willing, willing and creation. These are two, the, the, like the fact that Allah knows what's going to happen in the future is not, a, is not a really a contradiction. It's not a tension or it cannot be proposed as one. But the fact that he's, now we're saying he wills it as well. What does he mean? What do we mean by he wills it? And we're going further and saying, no, he creates it as well. Now, if we say cre creation and willing, this is where there's a serious issue. Yeah. So did the Mutazilis like, is this their attempt at compatibilism, compatibilism or were they more inclined towards free will? No, no. The, the, everyone's trying to affirm Qadr. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, they were more inclined towards free will, definitely. Not one, one million percent. In fact, um, this is really interesting, okay? And I've, I've mentioned this to you before, but I'll mention it to you again. In Majma'at al Fatawa, Volume 8, where Ibn Taymiyyah speaks about these matters, there were three people that had a very similar kind of argumentation but they all went in three different directions. So you had, you had Ibn Taymiyyah, number one. You had this guy called Abu Hassan al-Basri, who was a Mu'tazili, right? And you had Fakhruddin al-Razi, who was a Ash'ari, as you know. And all, of, all three of them, they started off by talking about Qadr, free will, the importance of both, etc., etc. Abu Hassan al-Basri went more in the free will direction, okay? And he mentioned, he's key, Ibn Taymiyyah keeps mentioning this uh, character. Ar-Razi, he went into a deterministic direction. Now someone will say, oh, he's not a determinist. He is a determinist. Ar-Razi was a fully-fledged, hard determinist. And he, he, in the end of his uh, book, Nihayat al-Aqul, or al-Mutab al I can't remember which one of them, but I remember reading pages and pages and pages and pages. And at the end of it, it says, Al-Insan Muttar fi surati muhtar. That the human being is compelled in the image of being choice, uh, a choice creature. That he's, 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 there's an illusion of choice, but he's actually compelled. That's hard determinism, that's Jabr. That is, that is exactly Jabr. But that's not to say that all Ash'aris had his opinion. Because when Ghazali talks about the same issues, he doesn't have the same conclusions, you see. Um, so he, was, he went in the hard determinist direction Al-Basri went more in the kind of uh, libertarian direction, if you like. And Ibn Taymiyyah genuinely tried the middle ground. Genuinely tried the middle ground. Although he, he, there were some methodological issues, and he had to do tawaqqaf at one point, which we'll come to uh, in more follows. So the Ash'aris, 
they have an issue, they, they have a, a concept called kasp, or it's referred to as acquisition. So they say that when the person, like, and, and this is something which most other groups do not understand this, and it doesn't really uh, solve much, I have to be honest and say. They say that when the person is, uh, yani Allah is in control of everything, but there are points, عِنْدَ قُدْرَتِهِ They say that as the, when the person makes, like for example, dua, or he makes petition, and uh, at that point, it's not because of his qudra, but عِنْدَ قُدْرَتِهِ Whatever that is meant to mean. At the point of his qudra, or Allah's ability, he gives him permission, or acquisition, or kasp, which, I don't know what that means. I, I looked at it, I thought about it, but to me it didn't make much sense. I, I don't know if it makes sense to you. Uh, uh, <laughs> to me, they did not solve any issues. And most people outside of the Ash'ari tradition don't accept this. Because it's not very uh, satisfying uh, intellectually, to be honest with you. Anyway, so this is the Ash'ari position. Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim. Ibn Taymiyyah, as we said, he did solve some problems. And I'll tell you what problems he solved. But he could not solve other, or he could not answer other questions. As you recall, I said that Qadr is of four types, or four different uh, stages. We said the Ilm, we, we said the, the Mashi'ah, or the Irada, the, the will of God, and then we said the, 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 the Kitaba, which is the writing, and then we said the Khalq. We said one of the, one of the big issues was Khalq. Because how can Allah create something, and that thing has free will? So he said, and, and by the way, this is a serious problem for an occasionalist. Remember, Ash'aris are, for the most part, occasionalist. Meaning, an occasionalist believes that there's no such thing as secondary cause and effect. Or that, let me be very specific here, because I don't want to misrepresent, yeah? Al-Ghazali believes there's no necessary link between cause and effect. He, it, it, does, it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean there's no cause and effect. It just means there's no necessary link between cause and effect. Which was the same op op opinion of Leibniz, by the way. Yeah? The, when do we mean necessary link between cause and effect? Okay, so this, this is uh, uh, Capri Sun. Okay, if I drop it, that, that's the effect. Okay? Now, am I dropping it? Am I the one that's dropping it? So the Ash'ari will say, listen. I say, look. There are... If you you know this kind of um, what's that called you know the uh, the black and white movies they used to put on the thing and then there used to be like different slides of uh, f photos. Film. The film, yeah, the, you know those old ones, the old films. Is that what it's called? I think so. Yeah, pictograph. So it's like it's like different um, different uh, images. Frames. Different frames. Yeah, different frames. So e they will say each frame does not have a link to the previous one. So you have a generator, which is the, the, the generator, and one frame and the next frame, the, the first, let's say there's five frames, and they're all showing one thing and the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, and it looks like a full movie, and it looks like they're all causing each other, all the previous things are being caused by the prior things. Ash'aris say, well actually, occasion, uh, occasion, occasionalism says that each one is being directly caused, ultimately, by God. So although it looks like one is causing two and two is causing three and three is causing four and four is causing five, What's actually happening is Allah is causing one, Allah is causing two, Allah is causing three, Allah is causing four, Allah is causing five. Do you get it? Does that make sense? This is what occasionalism means. Okay. Now, if you believe in occasionalism, the problem is what? What do you think the problem is? What's the major issue with occasionalism? It solves one issue. What, what issue does it solve and what issue does it create? Speak for two minutes because I think we need to digest this a little bit. Two minutes and we'll come back and uh, answer this question. Okay, um, so now we, we're back. We're back on the, uh, the occasionalist uh, discussion. So the advantages of occasionalism, or what does occasionalism preserve, or aim to preserve? Let's put it that way. What does occasionalism aim to preserve? The sovereignty of God. How so? By uh, asserting you know, fully that he's in control of everything. Mm-hmm. And on the other, whilst you're still there, uh, on the other hand, what can it compromise? Human free will. Why is that? Because uh, there is no s scope or domain for human beings to will if God is 
uh, there's not even any secondary causation at all. Mm. At, at least not necessarily. Then. Right, right, right. Good, good. So, so the issue here is, it goes back to uh, cosmic ventriloquism. You know, the idea is that, okay, if God is p causing everything, I want, he's causing me to do everything I'm doing right now. I'm a puppet. So some would accuse oca of occasionalism, of being the occasionalism and determinism being two sides of the same coin. Some would accuse that being the case. So there's no free will. What are you talking about? They will say, this is, and this is the op opinion of Ibn Qayyim, in fact. So when he talks about Jabris in his Shifa al-Alil, which is his uh, magnum, I'm not going to say magnum opus, but his main book on the subject, right? When he says, when Ibn Qayyim mentions Jabris, he's talking about Ash'aris. Because he considers their position to be a position of determinism. But then he, he attempts himself to answer this question. And I looked at the eighth chapter of his work. Obviously, I looked at all of his work. But the eighth chapter in particular gave some uh, clues, some very interesting clues, as to how he tries to solve some problems. And I do think that they do solve some issues. Uh, Ibn Qayyim and Ibn Taymiyyah. And I think we need to look at the work critically because it does solve some issues here. Ibn Qayyim says, imagine you have a slave. Or imagine there is a slave. A slave, like an owned slave. Yeah. The owner gives the slave some money. And this, the, the slave goes into the market. And the owner tells the slave what to buy and what not to buy. And then he, as he's doing that, he says, if you buy X, this is good, this is what we need. But if you buy the wrong thing and, you know, misuse the money, misappropriate the funds, then we will, uh, then I will punish you, okay? And the key word that he uses here is idhn, permission. Permission. So he says, who is really in control? He says, who is really in control? The slave owner is in control. He says the slave owner is really in control. So whereas the slave goes into the marketplace and buys things and all these kind of things, and if he buys the wrong thing, he'll be punished. And he buys the right things, then he'll be uh, rewarded. So really, because the money comes from the slave owner, and he gives him permission, that permission can be taken away from him at any time. Therefore, the slave owner is always in charge. And therefore, he says, the same thing applies with us and Allah. That Allah, we are the slaves of Allah. He gives us permission to act within free will. And if we do the right things, we will be uh, rewarded. And if we do the wrong things, we will be punished. What are the strengths and, advan uh, what are the strengths and weaknesses of this? That was my question. Yeah. So what, what, are the, what are the strengths and limitations of this uh, particular parable? I'll give you two, three minutes again, because this requires thought. So I, I believe yeah. in that, and yeah. up, until now, up until you mentioned the, the ayah in the Quran, that God says that God created the future as well. Yeah. So um, I, would, I would believe in, in this. I would say, like, uh, God gave us permission. Um, so God knows everything. And uh, he, he just, in, in his all power, decided to give us free will and no, no interfering with our free will. Yep. It doesn't mean he, he can't. He can. He has more power. He is. And but you, you mentioned this the ayah that God created the uh, future. So th that's where I uh, okay. I'm confused. Uh, there's an issue with saying that God doesn't interfere in our free will. Uh, if we put it in that language, it's as if we have a will that's uh, outside of the will of God. And the, and the, in the, the Quran states explicitly, وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَيَّ شَاءَ اللَّهِ That you will not will except if Allah wills. Because in this example, yeah. it's, uh, as soon as the, the owner is given the money to the slave, yeah. he's kind of out of the equation. So he's unaware of the actions of the slave. Mm. Therefore, if we use this kind of example, it limits the, um, the knowledge of Allah. Okay, right. So th this is an issue to do with knowledge. Let's let's assume that he can see and he surveils everything. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that that's possible. That he can see exactly. He put a camera on the slave. He can see everything he's doing. He can stop it at any, any time. What's still the problem here? There's still a problem. The the problem is so. The, I guess the first of all, the strength is that the responsibility 
is on the slave, right? Yeah. That he chooses um, what um, you know what to buy, you know, good and bad. However, you could say the limitation is that it diminishes the sovereignty how, of, how? of Allah. How, how does it diminish? Because um, the slave, um, if we say that responsibility is on him, then this means that Allah, he's like a, he's not in control of what the slave does. There's you still know, an issue, right? Right. right. Yeah, there's still an issue. He's not in control of you know what the slave buys. You know, if it's good or bad. Right, and it goes back to what we were talking about with the whole uh, swimming pool yeah. example, right? Uh, this, this, the slave acting autonomously, yeah. independently. Yeah. This is the issue. Uh, well, how can you have an independence outside of Allah? Yeah. This, is, this is the major limitation. Now, Ibn Qayyim, seemingly unaware, quite frankly, he, he goes on to say this is the haqq which Islam came with. And, you know, I mean, but, but there, is, there is a limitation in this parable. Just like there's a limitation with what Ashari say. This Ibn Taymiyyah is much more careful. Yeah. Let's just say that the slave owner has some kind of chain that connects with the the slave. So without the cha this chain, the slave it wouldn't even have a um, life. No, but if if the slave decides to look left, look right, do uh, go up, any thought that the slave yeah, has. So anything he's doing. Yeah. It's yeah. because uh, of the energy that is coming from this. Um, then he becomes a puppet, doesn't he? Yeah, and there's no responsibility. Right. So this is <laughs> the issue, right? This is the issue. Uh, now, so yeah, it becomes yeah. So, this the slave operating. Yeah. Going to the market, deciding, uh, like, thinking, buying whatever. Um, having the free will. Having free will, basically. Mm. Uh, it's it's okay. The problem. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, the fact that the slave is capable of doing that, is because of God. Does, I don't know, does, does that make sense? It's because of the slave owner, that he has some kind of um, um, connection. Yeah, that, that he's still acting independently, right? But he's acting independently because the slave owner gave him the gave him the. Um, no, but if he's acting independently, then that's it. That's that's all. But it. it's not fully independent. It's just for that. No, I get it. But even anything yeah. that he does, anything that he does by himself, there's a problem there. There is a problem. And by the way, I've thought about this, and I got headaches over this. I don't think about this. <laughs> yeah. Don't think about this. In fact, you know, the Salaf, to be honest with you, they they for good reason, yeah, <laughs> they advised not to think too much about the mechanics of this. Yeah. For good reason, yeah. Um, I just thinking about okay, the because yeah. because uh, now I was thinking like the you know how they mentioned Casper right like that sounded like convincing in that situation but I guess Casper all it does is it just reduces the problem to the very small point in time it's the same problem but it just reduces it to well, a small it doesn't point even in time. explain anything to me it doesn't what were you talking about like Casper does not explain a thing I mean they just introduce this mechanic but the mechanic has the yeah. same problems that we're talking about. Yeah, well, the mechanic doesn't even doesn't even it does it has yeah, zero it doesn't add anything. It yeah. doesn't it has zero explanatory scope. Yeah, zero explanatory scope. Yeah. Uh, and this is me being rough. Maybe some uh, some metori, sorry, not even metori, some some asharis or some people are gonna say this guy's he's he's ripping into everyone. So what's this guy's become a deviant or this and that. No, I'm just being honest. Uh, at, at the end of the day, there's some things we cannot explain. Yeah. Uh, all I'm saying is that the analogies will always be problematic. Now Ibn Taymiyyah. He stopped at the right place, I think. He did tawaqqaf. He was m more careful than Ibn Taymiyyah. If you read Majmuat al Fatawa, Volume 8, versus Shafa'ul Alil, to me, Ibn, Ibn Qayyim goes a bit further, like with these analogies. I Ibn Taymiyyah said the following thing, and I think which, which solves the problem here. It does actually solve an issue. He says, going back to the whole secondary, ver first and secondary causation thing, this is the point you were making, yeah? Very simple examples. He says, and this is what kids ask. My kids ask me this question all the time. Who created the building? Okay, there's two answers to this question, right? Okay, the uh, human beings created this building. You know, the Bob created this building, you know, whoever. But also the materials that were in place for Bob to create the building were in place because something was created from nothing, which we believe came from Allah. So there's a primary causation, a secondary causation. Ibn Taymiyyah says, well, look, you have a mother who causes a child. And by the way, what Ibn Qayyim and Ibn Taymiyyah do very well or good is to show that the Quran agrees with the notion of sab sababiyyah, or the, uh, the idea of 
causation. You know, it, in many different po points, you know, it is the fat sababiya there. Fat, uh, the letters indicating causality. Um, anyway, many ayats, like too many to enumerate. He says, from one perspective, the child is caused by the mother. But from the other perspective, ultimately, it's caused by Allah. The plant is caused by, sorry, yeah, by the seed. But from the other perspective, it's caused by Allah. So you have two different perspectives. You have the, sec the first perspective, which is uh, things are caused by the Allah. Ultimately, everything is caused by Allah. But second, secondarily, things are caused by their immediate causes. And Allah allowed that to happen. Okay. Now, how does that happen with human free will and godly determinism? Ibn Taymiyyah rightly says, we don't know. We don't know this. And this is the answer. This is the answer to the question. I know it's still good. this is the right thing to say. And we don't know, and we will never know. I don't think this is something we can actually solve, because in fact, the the mechanics of how godly determinism works and human free will. Any analogy that you give me, I'll find a problem with it, even if it comes from the greatest minds. Any analogy you like to give me, I, I, I have, I have, I am confident I'll find a limitation with that analogy. And sometimes, I, you know, for, for many months, I used to be convinced with one type of analogy, and then I would come and realize after, some, after really pondering over it, in the shower, in the toilet, or in the, in the, wherever, walking in the street, there's a problem here. So instead of going through the toil of realizing that these analogies, all of them, none of them, have any exp uh, all explanatory scope of how both of things come together, realize that this is something which is cannot be uh, the explanatory scope of it. We don't know how the, the full extent of it. What we do know is this, though. What we can argue is this. We can argue for its non-contradiction. Now, I'll explain how, right? We first have to explain, we go back to our categories of possibility. Yes? So, so you're about to argue for the, um, the absence of contradiction in the compatibilist view that you're going to mm. say, but can you also argue for the incoherence of the determinist or the libertarian positions as well because right, someone, so someone could say that like with the determinist position or the libertarian position let's say i guess more so with the determinist argument you don't have to have this sort of gap of ignorance you can sort of just say this is the argument and it all flows through and it has coherence from that standpoint right so uh, the the issue is not with internal consistency when it comes to determinism because it is internally consistent the issue is with this explanatory scope there are some, some things it just doesn't explain. And with that, I actually want to direct your attention to a, a thought experiment that was put forward by Chrysippus, who was a Stoic. Chrysippus was a Stoic, and he was uh, religious. He was not speaking from the Christian paradigm or the Muslim paradigm, or whatever, which shows you how universal this issue is. Right? And he gave the example of the cone and the ball. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of this example. Have you heard of it? Yeah, you Did I mention it in the... I've written it down, obviously. I've, I've put this in my essay, and obviously you can see it. But the cone and the ball is that you put it, you know, you've got a cone and you have a ball. And he said, if you get a cone and you get a ball, and you push either of them, or both of them, let's say you push both of them at the same time with the same force, same velocity, and at the top of the hill, yeah? If you push the cone, what's going to happen to it? It's got a flat surface. So is it going to go anywhere? It might go forward an inch. But the ball, if you push it, it's going to go rolling down, right? What is it that causes the ball to roll, but the cone to stay in one direction, or only to move forward a little bit? He would say, well, it's actually the intrinsic attributes of either the cone or the ball. There is something within the cone that's only making the cone move one inch, whereas the ball is, being, is rolling down. And that is an int int intrinsic attribute related to either the cone or the ball. The rotundity of the ball... You push it, it goes down, rolls, because it has roundness. The flatness of the cone that only moves forward a little bit. He said, likewise with human beings. You can put two human beings that have exactly the same experiences. Twins, with, with, you know. He doesn't say this, but I'm, I'm putting this, yeah. Twins with exactly the same life experiences, but in the same circumstances, same life circumstances, and they can act differently to the same extraneous variables. So one person, he gives the example of, 
s finding some money in the street. Some people would go and try and find the rightful owner and give it back to them. Some people would just take it for themselves. But you can apply this example to other things. There are some things which, if you do, uh, if two people that have the same experiences and whatever it is, they will act you cannot say that they won't act differently. You cannot say they will act exactly the same way. And this establishes the principle of difference. There's some intrinsic thing that differentiates person A from person B, which would make person A do something otherwise uh, or, d or differently from person B. Just like the cone acts differently to the ball. Now this is interesting because there is a hadith to this effect. And I, I, of all the analogies that I looked at, this was one of the best, if not for me, the top, one of the top best ones, one of them, we'll keep, keep it as one of them, that indicates the principle of difference between, which, which by the way would indicate free will, because if there's difference in the way that two people act to the same extraneous variables, that would indicate that they have different choices to make, or that they're, they're, they're that one person's uh, unencumbered uh, choice to choose A over B is different from the other person's unencumbered choice, or sorry, um, even call it encumbered choice to choose A over B or B over A. The fact that B over A is being chosen by person A and A over B is being chosen by person B indicates difference in choice making ability between A and per person A and person B, which indicates something intrinsic within A, person A, that's not in person B, or vice versa which would indicate that there is some choice being, make, being made. And there's a, a beautiful hadith which is much more easy to... I'm going to read this uh, word for word, right? This, the similitude of guidance and knowledge with which Allah has sent me is like a rain which has fallen on some ground. A fertile part of earth has, observed, has, sorry, has absorbed water and brought forth much grass and herbs. Another part which is solid held the water and Allah benefits men thereby who drink and give others to drink and use it for irrigation. But for some it has fallen on a portion of sandy land which neither retains the water nor produces herbage. Such is the likeness of a man who understands the religion of Allah and who gets benefit from um, and who gets benefit of what Allah has sent me with. He learns and teaches others. It is also the likeness of a man who neither raise, raises his head on, the, on that account, meaning he does not benefit from what the Prophet was sent with, nor accept Allah's guidance with which I was sent. Meaning, you have this extraneous variable, okay? You have the water coming onto the earth. There are some parts of the earth which react to it by producing herbage, fertile parts of the earth, and other parts of the earth which are dry which don't react to it by not producing verb herbage. Well, this is very similar to the Chrysippus example. So there's intrinsic attributes within those parts of the earth which allow herbage to be produced in one place and not allow, and other intrinsic attributes of other parts of the ground which don't allow herbage to be produced in another part. Suggesting what? There's something intrinsic within some people that makes them respond to revelation, in this case this um, external thing, which is coming out, and makes them respond to it positively or negatively. And that, that internal thing is manat, or the, the manba, or the um, point of tribulation for that person. Now how that point of tribulation for that person is, is in a compatible relationship with godly determinism, how the two things work is impossible to know. But that, we can establish the principle of difference. If we can establish the principle of difference, then a determinist must now explain why it is that this principle or this thing exists, and why is it as well, in addition, that we have this first-person subjective experience of, of difference, or of, um, of choice. There are two things which a, a determinist cannot explain. Why is it that I feel like I'm in charge? Why is it that I feel like I can have my own choices? It's a first, it's intrinsic. It's as good for me as that I exist. That I know I can do and say what I want to say and do. A conversation that you have with a determinist. Any conversation that you have with a determinist. The, uh, what's predicated or what's uh, presupposed in that conversation is that I know what I'm saying and I'm choosing what I'm saying. And what he knows what he's saying and what he's choosing what he's saying. There is a pathetic irony, therefore, 
in choosing to be a determinism. Uh, I put this in my Twitter. Uh, you know, there is a pathetic irony in that because how could you choose to be? This? I mean, the idea of being a determinist is that you don't have any choice. So the, 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 it's not that determinism doesn't have internal consistency. We're not saying it doesn't. We're saying it doesn't have the full explanatory scope. It doesn't explain um, a huge part of the human experiences, which is to have free will or the subjective, ex first, first and subjective experience of having free will, which is foundational to rationalism. And moreover, it doesn't explain the principle of difference. Being a libertarian doesn't explain why things have causes and effects. Um, or how, how you can explain how things... Because what, the, what libertarians will do is say, well, they'll, they'll claim some kind of quantum reality. So we don't really don't know. Maybe there's a quantum field or something, or some kind of quantum reality or function that stops causes from having effects. Therefore, we are in charge. You know? But that's, again, just speculation. Um, you, can use quanti you can use the word quantum to get away from anything. To make anything un um, unintelligible sound intelligible. You see, what's going quantum, yeah, quantum. <laughs> you know? But they wouldn't use qu these quantum explanations with their everyday life. I mean, why don't you get the milk today? Oh, because it was quantum, whatever. No, no one uses this kind of explanation. They only use it in the, the metaphysic, uh, me metaphysical dialogues. So, so, we, uh, so we, uh, the guy was uh, explaining all these ideas, determinism, everything, and everything made sense. And you start to think like, if everything makes sense to you, why why you don't believe in it? And <coughs> at the end of the video, he said, "But we have quantum reality." Yeah, exactly. Yeah, let's see. So, so yeah, we don't know. Exactly. Yeah. So going back to the point, <laughs> what was I about to explain before you uh, mentioned again? Sorry, the the absence of contradiction. In right, 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 right. So we explain now why the other positions, the libertarian positions and the uh, Jabari positions, or if you like, the determinist positions, are problematic. Not because they lack an internal consistency, but because they lack an explanatory scope. Especially relates to uh, first-person subjective experience of choice-making ability and the principle of difference. And on the other hand, the, the existence of an antecedent causal chain, uh, which uh, which does determine, at least on the face of it, why things are the way they are. Now, in terms of what we can argue for, is the fact that it doesn't. What is a, what is impossible? So we have we go back to the categories of uh, of possibility, impossibility, and necessity. Nece necessary thing is something that cannot be any other way. An impossible thing is something which cannot exist because it's self-contradictory, like a squared circle. And a possible thing is something which, or a contingent thing, is something which depends on something else. With the beginning, it's finite, it could be some other way, whatever, yeah? Now, w or as it, now the question theologically is, what is impossible for Allah? Or what, not for Allah, what is impossible in relation to Allah? So things which are impossible that, that are meaningless, like for example, which are not a shape, which are not a thing. So can Allah create a squared circle? We would say such a question assumes the existence of such a thing as a squared circle. And a squared circle is not a thing. It's impossible. Therefore, asking if Allah can create a squared circle is a meaningless statement. Now, in order for us to uh, say that the existence of godly determinism and human free will is impossible, it would have to fit the same category of asking the question whether Allah can create a squared circle. But what we know is, through the principle of difference, that not only is godly determinism, or even, if we take the secular view, any determinism, if we accept the causal chain, necessary, uh, possible but it's necessary, and human free will is necessary. So these, two, these, two, these two things have become qat'i, or yaqini. We are certain that we have free will because of our experience. We are certain that we have a free will because of the principle of difference. But we are also certain that, given the causal chain, that there is determinism. So we are certain of two things, which on the face of the uh, on the face of it are opposite to each other. Can Allah or does the existence, the coexistence of these two things, which on the face of it seem contradictory? 
Does it defy any of the attributes of God? Such that it would be referred to as impossible. So we say no. It, what, what attributes of God does it defy? It's, it can't be impossible because both of those things are necessary. Yeah, both of, the, both of those things are necessary. So we can't say that their coexistence is impossible because we are we can we can we can we can affirm the existence of both free will and determinism. Now the only other way to say that this is impossible for God is if it if it contradicts one of the intrinsic attributes of God, such to say that, for example, um, you know, uh, God, can, the question: Can God become a man? Because if God is all-knowing and all-powerful, how could he become something which is limited and, uh, and not powerful? But either of the existence of either of those two things don't defy, do not defy the, any of the attributes of God. The only way they can, in the case of human free will, is if it's independent. It's the mustaqil, which we deny. That is, so human free will does not exist independently. But how can it not exist independently and we still have free will? That's what we don't know. You see the point? So we believe in a human free will which does not exist independently, but which is compatible with godly determinism. Free choice. Yeah, free choice. We, we believe in that. But how do these two things interpenetrate, if you like, or if you use the words, symbiotically exist or compatibly exist? It's uh, something which is... Um, we c can only be speculative in this. Uh, we just don't have the scope for it. We just don't have the scope for it. Uh, and so, this is really what e where it ends. Um, and so, in terms of um, answering the question of how these two things can be compatible, we say that they have to be compatible, but we don't know how. How do they have to be compatible? Because both of them are necessary. It's, it's quite similar to the situation with um, quantum mechanics. You've got things which contradict the macro, uh, or at least on the face of them, seemingly. But we know they most bo bo both exist. This is actually stronger than that. Because this one is, we can affirm it through rationalization. Not, it doesn't have the problem of induction, actually. Mm. This doesn't even have the problem of induction. So uh, we have two necessary things which mu must exist. And how they exist together, we don't know. Just like to say, how Allah hears, how Allah knows. How does Allah hear? The question of how does Allah hear is something we have never known. <laughs> how does Allah hear? But why do we, why do we have a, um, a special treatment with how Allah does Qadr? It's one of his attributes as well. We've always, says, we've always said, and this is concurrent with all the schools of Islamic thought, Bila Kaif, that it's we don't know how. When it comes to the attributes of God, we don't know how. You can ask us what they are, and we'll tell you Allah is all-knowing, all-hearing. He's the Qadir. He's the uh, Muqtadir, he's the one who puts Qadr uh, and all of that. But if you ask us how the functions, of, well, this is above our pay grade completely, and how this works with this, and oh, we don't, sorry to say, we don't know. And anyone who tries to know, uh, to put forward, as we said, an analogy to try and find out, is going to find some problem. Some people will find this is problematic. And I spoke to one guy in Canada, and he said, I left Islam because of this. I said, all right. And I th the video is actually online. I said, you left Islam because of this. I said, what have you become? He, sa he said, I've become you know, an, an, agnost or an agnostic or an atheist. How about Islam? I said to him, no, I said to him um, so what school of thought do you accept? Do you accept compatibilism? Do you accept uh, determinism? Or do you accept libertarianism? Because you still have the same problem. And whatever school of thought you go with, you're still going to have issues or questions that are being asked. Because this issue is not a Muslim-specific issue. This is an issue that people from all groups have been struggling with for thousands of years and they know the reasons why they're struggling with it is because there are two things which are clear as day or that can be demonst demonstrated which are true but we don't know how they work together that's why the issue is there but they must work together and if they don't lots of, th lots of things will be inexplicable and so he understood that and he accepted that but he still uh, for other reasons decided not to become Muslim at that time hopefully he's become Muslim now but this is a thing. If you leave Islam for this, what other world system will solve it for you? You've got the same issues everywhere, and this is this is the pro this is the problem. So, and this is why I've, I've I've come to know 
when I debate Christians and Jews and atheists, they don't really bring this up as a contention. Do you know, ironically and funny enough, this is always brought up as a contention by Muslims. Never by anyone else, because those who are intellectual enough know that they have the same questions that need to be asked. And with that, I conclude. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alright, so I, I wanted to read something here from, uh, from the essay that I put on Sapiens' uh, website. And obviously you can get that for free, yeah, if you haven't already. It's on this, on this very topic. Um, so I'll read the, basically the last paragraph that I wrote. It goes like this. In an age of cancer and coronavirus, there are many things that are beyond our control. A robust theory of theological determinism makes sense of otherwise seemingly senseless events of needless human suffering. According to a worldview characterized by atheistic materialism, there is no objective reason why evil or suffering happens. Everything is merely a, a series of arrangements and rearrangements of physical atoms. I am ultimately no more significant than a slab of meat in the butcher shop. My physical annihilation in a car accident or a plane crash is no more objectively significant than the destruction of a snowman. snowman. The atheist philosopher Alex Rosenberg admits this candidly. Stating that the purpose, and uh, so that purpose and its parent aboutness are illusions created by introspection. On such a view of existence, I do not believe that there is any number of drugs one could take or distractions one could pursue to make life feel ultimately worth living. Pastorally, helping religious people to see and acknowledge God's wisdom is half of the psychological battle. The other half relates to giving them hope in their own choices. Now. Uh, one of my favorite hadiths, potentially my, my favorite one, is the hadith in Sahih Muslim, which states the following. It says, عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ That wondrous is the affair of the believer. In the أَمْرَهُ كُلَّهُ لَهُ خَيْرٌ That all of his uh, um, affairs are good. وَلَيْسَ ذَاكَ لِأَحَدٍ إِلَّا لِلْمُؤْمِنِ And this is not the case for anyone except for the believer. إِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ صَرَّا شَكَرْ If good things happen to him, he is thankful. وَإِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ ضَرَّ صَبَرَ وَشَكَرَ And if bad things happen to him, he's patient and he's thankful. When you have a robust theory of theological determinism, combined with ikhtiar, or the idea of free will, what you can confront life with now is a sense of non-regret. You don't have to feel like you regret this and I regret that, because at the end of the day, this is written. The feeling of, oh, this person died in my family or this person has uh, this mental illness, or this particular physical illness, or, or I have this particular illness, or whatever it is that has happened, continues to happen, or will happen in the future, all of this is God's plan. And He puts that in your life for a particular reason. And when you really believe in Qadr, and you have faith in the fact that God is operating according to your ability, and He is testing you according to your ability, then this is probably the best psychological type of protection that you can get from the world. Everything has meaning. Every single thing has meaning. From when you wake up to when you go to sleep. Everything has meaning. Everything has purpose. You are, you've been given a tailored, a customized test that fits your persona, your intrinsic qualities. This is the Islamic belief. And so every single... Uh, time you feel pain there's a there's a reason for that every single time you feel anger or an uncomfortable feeling there's a reason for that it's a test it's a punishment potentially it's potentially a punishment uh, for what your hands have put forward and if so then it's a t then it's a, it's, it's a cleansing of your sins if you are upon the right belief it's all of those things and more so it's the only thing, and that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, لِلْمُ... إِلَّا لِلْمُؤْمِنِ that This is not for anyone except for the believer, because on, on materialist grounds, all of this stuff is random or haphazard. But from the Islamic perspective, it's all, it's like a movie that you are the protagonist in. Everything is meaningful, pain becomes meaningful. And it becomes part of a greater plan. And so, although in many ways, Allah has tested us with not being able to understand the full nature of the mechanics of Qadr. He's also gifted us with the fact that if we believe in Qadr, it acts as the, the ultimate 
antidote for life's problems and life's pains and so on. And with that, we conclude with Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.